Good evening. Welcome. If I can invite everyone to uh, settle in for what should be a very enjoyable evening. Welcome one and all to the 25th annual Parsons Cooper Hewitt Graduate Symposium in the History of Decorative Arts and Design. Our theme this year, showing off design and ostentation. I am, for those of you who don't know me, Ethan Roby. I'm the Associate Director of the Master's Program in the History of Decorative Arts and Design um, offered by Parsons and Cooper Hewitt, Smithsonian Design Museum. Um, unfortunately, Sarah Lichtman, our director, um, sends her regrets she could not make it this evening. Um, however, I will be taking her place. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you here tonight, not only those of you sitting here uh, in this lecture hall, but those of you joining us virtually by live stream. Hello. Um, <laughs> live streaming tonight's event is just one more way for the MA program to broaden our reach and keep in touch with our many alumni near and far. And I would like to uh, particularly acknowledge and thank one of our alumni, Marjorie Misenter, um, for her role and her hard work as the MA program liaison to Cooper Hewitt's Board of Trustees. So thank you, Marjorie. Um, to welcome you here tonight on behalf of Cooper Hewitt, and it's my pleasure to introduce Kara McCarty, the Cooper Hewitt Museum's Curatorial Director. Good evening, everyone, uh, here and also virtually. Um, I, too, on behalf of the museum, would love to welcome all of you here this evening. And um, I'm thrilled that the Catherine Hooper Vorsanger keynote is back at Cooper Hewitt. Many of you know the museum was closed for several years for renovation, and we opened up just about a year and a half ago. And it was last year when we were able to resume um, this series here at the museum. So. Um, now we are back in full swing and thrilled to have all of you here this evening. I had the privilege of meeting Catherine many years ago um, in the mid-1990s when she and her colleagues uh, were working on their landmark Herder Brothers exhibition. Um, and I was at the St. Louis Art Museum at the time. And whether or, or she was in New York or far, Catherine had a wonderful reputation as a curator, a scholar, a connoisseur, and the most wonderful collegial spirit. And she had the generosity to share her knowledge. What I remember most of all was her infectious passion for objects and her scholarship, and her amazing costume jewelry. <laughs> the way she scrutinized every nook and cranny in a piece of furniture was just, it would excite anybody about a wooden leg. And given her love of objects and her influential role as an educator in Cooper Hewitt Parsons Master's Program, it is so befitting that this annual series is here at Cooper Hewitt. The Master's Program has become an integral part of the museum. This collaborative effort between the museum and Parsons, the New School for Design, started in 1982 when a master's program in what is now called the History of Design and Curatorial Studies was established. It continued the collection's original legacy as a teaching museum, and Cooper Hewitt has become a recognized center for scholarly and applied research, providing professional development and museum training to graduate students. And I must say, I'm sure there are a number of graduate students and alumni here in the audience today, and we could not do what we do at the museum without all of you. I say this to every incoming class. We embrace you. We urge you to take, all the students, to take full advantage of what we have to offer here. And a lot of that is our collection. And we have students helping us researching objects, cataloging objects, helping to research exhibitions. And again, we could not do what we do without them. So thank all of you for supporting the program, alumna, and um, all con future students who might be listening in. Welcome. Thank you so much, Kara. Now, many of you may have noticed when you came in the lecture hall that you were handed a journal. This is, of course, our new second issue of the MA program student journal, Objective. Um, 
If you didn't get one coming in, we will have more uh, at the reception following the talk tonight. I am absolutely delighted to launch this year's issue of Objective, um, and I'd like to acknowledge the tremendous amount of work and effort that went into its production. As many of you know, Objective is a student-edited and organized publication, and I just want to extend thanks to Catherine Powell, the editor-in-chief, who is here somewhere, um, designer, <laughs> and uh, Bill Schaefer for all of his work uh, doing design. This lovely video. And obviously all the alumni and students who contributed to the journal, helped out with editing and everything else that went into it. Obviously also big thanks go out to Marilyn Cohen, uh, the faculty advisor for the journal for her dedication and commitment to getting it all done and thank you all for such a wonderful publication. Um, I encourage you to look through this publication and for those of you attending virtually, you can always contact us in the MA program office. We'll be delighted to mail you a copy. Now, we officially open the symposium with a keynote address named in honor of Catherine Hoover Vorsanger, a distinguished scholar, esteemed curator of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and a gifted speaker, advisor to many of our students, and a teacher and a beloved faculty member uh, here at the master's program for over a decade uh, until her untimely passing. During that time, Catherine inspired our students and faculty. She was an extraordinary presence who excelled in nurturing the graduate students and interns with whom she worked and who shared her interest in post-federal American furniture and decorative arts. She touched the lives of a generation of students and here to tell us more about Catherine Vorsanger and the fund named in her honor, I'd like to introduce Dr. Barry Harwood, Curator of Decorative Arts at the Brooklyn Museum, longtime faculty member in the Parsons Cooper Hewitt program, um, and a close friend of Catherine Vorsanger and a great champion of this annual symposium in her name. Well, this evening is always both sad, uh, but it also makes me very proud. Proud to be part of uh, the faculty here at um, Cooper Hewitt and, um, uh, but sad because of uh, it does commemorate and mark the passing of Catherine Hoover Vorsanger. Uh, it always warms my heart to see <laughs> many of her uh, dear friends here. And this evening, especially uh, because our speaker, Ulysses Dietz, was um, a colleague and also a good pal of Catherine. So it really uh, brings it all home for, um, for all of us. Uh, Catherine was more than a colleague. She was an extremely, extremely um, dear friend. Uh, but for those of you who don't know a great deal about her, it's only a name that you see on the cover of very, very important uh, books on the 19th century, I would just very, very briefly like to tell you a bit about her really extraordinary, extraordinary life. So Catherine was a graduate of Smith College and she earned her master's and PhD degrees from the City University of New York. She began her career as an assistant curator of fine arts and exhibitions at the California Historical Society in San Francisco. In 1979, Catherine moved to New York and in 1983 joined the staff of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. At the Metropolitan, Catherine distinguished herself by participation in in an impressive series of exhibitions and publications, including, of course, Herda Brothers Furniture and Interiors for a Gilded Age. She was also the coordinator and contributor, contributing author of the seminal Art in the Empire City, New York, 1825 to 61. In addition, Catherine contributed to American Paradise, the world of the Hudson River School in 1988. She organized the decorative arts of Frank Lloyd Wright in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1994 and coordinated and updated and computerized, uh, not personally, but helped computerize <laughs> the thousands of objects in the Henry R. Luce Center for the Study of American Art that opened in 1989. Her dictionary of uh, architects, artisans, artists, and manufacturers in the catalog for the 1987 exhibition, In Pursuit of Beauty, 
has become the standard reference for the field of late 19th century American design. As curator in the Department of American Decorative Arts at the Metropolitan, Catherine was responsible for the acquisition of a score of masterpieces of American furniture that enrich our artist, art, artistic community and have brought a greater understanding of the contribution of American cabinet makers to the history of furniture. Catherine lectured widely on American furniture from her native San Francisco to London and from Natchez to Newport. Uh, she also served as a board member of the Metropolitan Chapter of the Victorian Society in America. Her grace and style were a hallmark of her scholarship and personal deportment. Perhaps, however, it was Catherine's passion as a teacher and collegiality for which she will be most remembered and missed by those who knew and worked with her. She always strove to make both her personal intellectual resources and those of the Metropolitan Museum available to other scholars and institutions without regard to their prestige. It was this utterly rare and unique combination of poise, grace, sincerity, amity, humor, and intellectual accomplishments that marked Catherine's all too short career. And she is profoundly missed by all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barry. That was very kind. And as Barry um, also mentioned, um, we are grateful for the many um, donors um, who have contributed in Catherine's name and who make this uh, keynote event and the reception and the whole symposium possible. We really thank all of you for your continued generosity. Tonight, for the Catherine Hoover Vorsanger keynote address, we are honored to welcome Dr. Ulysses Grant Deet, Dietz, excuse me, <laughs> Chief Curator and Curator of Decorative Arts at the Newark Museum. Mr. Dietz has been curator at New York since 1980 and has organized over 100 exhibitions during his tenure. He has published the New York Museum Collection of American Pottery in 1984 to mark the museum's 75th anniversary. A quarter century later, he updated that publication for the museum's centennial with Masterpieces of Art Pottery, 1880 to 1930. Mr. Dietz is particularly proud of his work on the New York Museum's 1885 Ballantine House, which was reinterpreted and restored as the centerpiece of the Decorative Arts Department between 1992 and 1994. In 1997, Mr. Dietz was the project director for The Glitter and the Gold, Fashioning America's Jewelry, the first ever exhibition and book on Newark's once vast jewelry industry. In 2006, he collaborated with his fellow curators on the exhibition Baubles, Bangles, and Bling, looking at jewelry in a global cultural context. And also in 2006, he mounted the exhibition Objects of Desire, 500 Years of Jewelry from the New York Museum. Here detecting a theme here, right? Because we're talking about ostentation and jewelry is all about that. And shortly after this, he collaborated with Janet Zapata, also a good friend of the program, on a book and exhibition about the jewelry collection of Doris Duke called Gems from the East and the West. In 2014, Dietz organized City of Silver and Gold from Tiffany to Cartier at the museum, documenting Newark's precious metal industries from the 1850s to the 1960s as part of the celebration of New Jersey's 350th anniversary. Most recently, he oversaw the reinstallation of the museum's Laurie Ross Jewelry Gallery with a material-based approach to this expanding jewelry collection. Mr. Dietz's talk tonight will be about materials in the use of jewelry and is called... Um, or rather the title of the talk, will be Meaning and Materiality, Making Jewelry with Gems and Junk. So please welcome me in, please rather, join me in welcoming <laughs> Ulysses Grant Dietz for the Vorsanger keynote address. I'm glad to be here. And I'm actually, I'm totally kind of humbled and honored to be here uh, because I did know Catherine Vorsanger and I won't... Uh, go on at length, but I, I remember her very quiet voice, her love of exotic velvet gloves, uh, her love of Miriam Haskell jewelry, and her very sharp analytical mind. And the, the project we worked most closely together on uh, was in the world of acquisitions, because the Newark Museum and the Metropolitan Museum together own a pair of unique sideboards by Alexander Rue, most likely made for the Astor family for their house, Rokeby, up on the Hudson River in the 1850s. 
And this was something that after the acquisitions were made, she and I had talked at length about doing research to prove this theory, which I'm convinced is true. But her death and my inability to do any research uh, <laughs> made that impossible. So that's, that's on my bucket list maybe in my retirement years. But I remember her very fondly, and I'm really honored to be speaking uh, in her name here. Uh, and that said, this will be a very informal talk, because if I try to be formal, I lose my place. And uh, the last time I spoke at a Smithsonian Institution museum, I tried to lead, read a lecture, and half of the live streaming was me looking around trying to find my place. So uh, this is only here in case I forget what I'm talking about. Uh, and I have to also say, in the room is one of the uh, Parsons Cooper Hewitt scholars, uh, Sarah Teichman, who in fact inspired me to take this material approach to the jewelry gallery. Now the Newark Museum Jewelry Gallery would fit on this stage. It's a small space, uh, and there's, but we have 155 pieces of jewelry uh, arranged according to materials uh, from stones, literally pebbles, to plastic. And, and, and that theme has been something I've been thinking about a great deal as I continue to build the museum's collection. Because although we are an art museum, we are not an art museum in the mode of any other art museum in the United States. And from the founding of the museum in 1909, uh, we have taken a rather odd tack in the way we approach things. Uh, there's nothing wrong with owning a masterpiece. <laughs> See, that's why I'm glad I'm not reading. I would have lost my place. Uh, <laughs> But the fact is, oddball things and strange objects have always been within the purview of our curators. And our collection of some 130,000 objects covering every aspect of global culture except European painting and sculpture, and if you really want to know why, you can ask me that afterward, um, uh, really covers the globe. And one of the things I've been so fascinated by is the universality of three things in human culture, pottery, textiles, and jewelry. And that has been an inspiration that's kept me thinking and nudging the other curators as chief curator, which I can do, uh, to collect in, in their areas in terms of jewelry as well. So uh, I love clever titles and don't read more into this than I meant, but I will show you one suite of jewelry that's sort of made out of junk. And, and that I will say, I'm a traditionalist. I came out of the Winter Tour program. Uh, I'm all about the tradition of brown furniture updated, up, up, up marketed into Victorian furniture or the 19th century, the Gilded Age. Uh, and that's where my heart lies. But I have learned to love the modern because the museum was founded to be a museum of the art of today. And that meant art pottery, Zuni pottery, African pottery, all of it shown as equivalent as art in our galleries, and, well, I can't do my math, 107 years ago. So let's start with pearls. So why pearls? And, and, and I actually uh, uh, wrote a piece for an online magazine about why pearls. What does this have to do with art? What does this have to do with anything except pearls are everything in the history of jewelry? If you're talking about meaning and materiality, if you're talking about showing off, and I was really tempted to put pictures of women wearing pearls, because I could have done that, but I, I want to limit my blathering here. Uh, I really, I realized that I needed pearls in the collection. I needed a string of pearls in the collection, but I needed a string of pearls that had meaning beyond just a string of pearls. Uh, and this came up, uh, this went through the various murky ways of the marketplace and surfaced in the jewelry building on Fifth Avenue when I was having something appraised for the museum. And uh, the guy who was appraising it said, oh, I know where those are. I can get you those. And I thought, oh, wow, this is what I've been looking for. So this is possibly the only surviving and best documented string of Gilded Age pearls left intact in the United States. And the reason they survived is they're not particularly big pearls. But there are 350 plus matched Asian freshwater pearls uh, in this 57 inch long rope, which as somebody pointed out to me, only a woman with servants would have owned because to put this thing away takes easily 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> And you can't just throw it in a drawer. And the fact that it survives in its original heart-shaped box. This suite of pearls was assembled uh, in New York City in, in 1906 by Marcus and Company for Henry Fairfield Osborne, who was the president of the American Museum of Natural History and the man who discovered and named both the Tyrannosaurus and the Velociraptor. So he is totally cool in the science world. <laughs> and he was, for their 25th anniversary, he bought this string of pearls, which I would guess probably cost him $15,000 
at the time for his wife, Lucretia Perry Osborne, uh, who is known to have wrote, wrote written several books, one of which was a biography of George Washington using his letters. So they were both smart, uh, culture-loving people, and clearly she, he loved her enough to give her this box of pearls uh, in its heart-shaped arrangement, and uh, they stayed intact. And I can only guess that they stayed intact because they're not big enough to break up into other strings of pearls. So I needed these, and they work perfectly, because pearls have been a symbol of ostentation since Cleopatra dissolved them in vinegar to keep her skin smooth. And apparently that's not a myth. That's apparently history, or at least someone wrote it down. Uh, <laughs> and pearls to me are sort of a great place to start because they are the one precious thing that doesn't have to be altered to make it into a piece of jewelry. You have to drill them to string them together or you can mount them in prongs, but a pearl is a pearl is a pearl. And it ultimately dis defines what makes something meaningful purely on a material basis. Nothing is precious unless we say it's precious. The only reason gold is valuable is that at some point in human history, someone found a nugget of this wonderful shining gold stuff and said, ooh, this must be magical, therefore it's precious, and we're going to build our entire economic system on this random gold material. Uh, and that's what it is. Things are precious, things are meaningful because we give them meaning, not because they have any inherent meaning. Meaning is applied to us. Animals do not collect jewelry. Well, that's not true. Bowerbirds collect jewelry too. But that's just because they like shiny, and we like shiny as well. <laughs> now, so the title of my exhibition, Pearls, Platinum, and Plastic, uh, was because for marketing you need alliteration. That's really about what it comes down to. Originally it was Pebbles, Platinum, and Plastic, and the marketing department killed that. So. <laughs> And then I found the pearls. But platinum is another one of those things. Metals are all interfered with by humankind. They must be dug up and processed in order to make them into something. And platinum happens to begin with a P, so that's why it won the, the honor of being in the title. But it's also a, an amazing sort of technological jump, because technology and human skill is all involved in the, pr in the, in the, in the procession of materials over time. You can pick up a rock off the ground, but in order to facet a stone and to polish it and to give it the highest color it could possibly have, it takes human intervention and knowledge and, and technology. But platinum was one of those things that it took, it was around for a long time, but it took a couple of centuries before people figured out how to use it, figured out how to really process it properly, and then figured out how to use it for jewelry because it's very hard it's very ductile. Uh, it, it doesn't tarnish, which is why it beats silver in terms of pl uh, putting diamonds in it, setting diamonds in it. But it takes a very high-powered torch to work it, to melt it, and to get it into this incredible framework. And I keep wanting to use this thing, so I guess I will. Is that the right button? Oh, that's the wrong button. <laughs> so. so can you put that back? <laughs> Oh, maybe I just, do I hit it again? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I couldn't see the laser symbol. There is the, but th this, the black material here is velvet. This was, this was, this belonged to the mother of Congresswoman Millicent Fenwick, who was a trustee of the Newark Museum and, and, a, and a great fascinating lady who had a bevy of servants and served you Campbell soup in her dining room and boasted about it. Um, <laughs> but this belonged to her mother who went down on the Lusitania in 1915. And it was a mourning brooch made in Baden-Baden, Germany by Cook Brothers. We have the original box. The pin could be taken off. It could be mounted as a hair ornament to put into your big updo in the early 20th century. And it shows the, the sort of the perfection and the ascendance of um, platinum as the king of metals in the early 20th century because these wonderful arches of leaves have no back support at all. That's just black velvet behind them. And all of these teeny tiny diamonds, which take a certain kind of uh, technological skill as well, are really mounted to create the shimmering effect of light across surface. It's not about rocks. It's about it's the prestige and the showing off is that they're diamonds, but it's not about big diamonds. It's about the use of diamonds in virtuosic ways that couldn't be done before the advent of the technology, both for platinum and for fine diamond cutting. 
And then plastic, which is a material that I've been struggling with for years and finally caved uh, at a symposium in Racine, Wisconsin at the Racine Art Museum, where there was a whole symposium about polymer clay and the advent of polymer clay in the 1990s as a material uh, for artistic jewelry. And this is a piece which, and I always say as a curator, you do not have to like the things that I like. Uh, I presented this to the trustees, uh, and I inadvertently heard my director over the phone refer to it as Ulysses' ugly necklace. Uh, <laughs> and one of the other trustees, however, paid for it uh, in, in memory of my first boss's wife. Uh, Rosetta Miller. So, But this is a piece made by a collaboration between Stephen Ford and David Forlano, who live in opposite sides of the country, but have known each other since art school uh, 25 years ago. And uh, they use polymer clays to create these elaborate mosaic jewels. This, the title of this is the full pillow necklace. So these are the pillow jewels, these sort of circular puffy jewels. And the biggest one is maybe two inches across. This is a, substan a substantial piece of jewelry. And then they collaborate with a woman silversmith to have the oxidized silver backings that reflect the patterns on the front in silver uh, who works in Philadelphia, a woman named Marianne Petrus. So this great sort of ceremonial jewel, which uh, takes a little wearing. It, it sort of spreads out to, the, not quite over your shoulders, but out to the edge, uh, pushes the envelope as far as I'm willing to go in terms of wearability. Uh, but I fell in love with this piece and wanted it and, and pushed it through in spite of the fact that my boss thought it was ugly. <laughs> I happen to think it's beautiful and it's in the show here, but it's the idea of plastic, something that is essentially worthless but totally created in a laboratory that could be transformed into a work of art. So the showing off here, the meaning here, the, uh, is, is only involved in the materiality in that it's kind of showing off by counterpoint, that this is about art. And the contrast between jewelry that's about gemstones and jewelry that's about artistic intent or content or meaning, and I don't think this has any content particularly. There's no deep hidden meaning. This is about ornament and decoration, which is perfectly fine. Uh, but the, the thing about this jewelry that is showing off is its scale and its intention by saying, if you don't get it, then you don't get it. And uh, it's easy to get a string of pearls. It's not easy to get a great collar of plastic. So we go back to the very beginning, and this is something where uh, I was collecting Newark-made jewelry for this exhibition. And then I thought, oh, wow, the greatest collection of Newark-made jewelry in the country. I and two other people care about that. And so I thought I, I should play on what we had in the collection. And uh, the wife of the director of the Metropolitan Museum, or the head of the board, Mrs. Robert DeForest, gave us a collection of crosses in 1950 which was called the Cross Collection. And I thought, well, that's, and most of them, in fact, are jewels. They are things that are meant to be worn on a chain. Uh, and so I began to think about that as the jewelry, part of the jewelry collection. And indeed, one of my favorite pieces is this 15th century Russian pectoral cross uh, with silver gilt filigree mounts and a, uh, on the ends of a four-armed um, jasper cross. But it's not a random piece of stone, it is, in fact, uh, a symbolic piece. So here's the thing where the meaning, there is ostentation in the craftsmanship in the material because silver was highly precious until other materials came along to shove it out of the way. Uh, but this is directly drawn from a passage in Deuteronomy and other places in the Bible which talk about the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem with walls of jasper. And it's also one of the 12 stones of the breastplate of Aaron. Uh, uh, who, was, who was Moses' brother, and it was the first high priest of the temple. And on the right, in a very similar kind of a story, but a modern day take on that, is an Israeli uh, jeweler named Vered Kaminsky, who simply w am, uh, wandered around uh, the, the, the holy city in Jerusalem and picked up stones off the ground and assembled them according to various shades of gray and beige and red and tan, and then caged them in 18 karat gold wire. So this becomes a sort of modern day, I've, I love this necklace, which we acquired out of an exhibition, because it's the sort of thing you could wear with a Chanel suit. It's a very elegant classic piece in spite of these rough stones, but there's also more content to that. It's not just this symbolic connection of Israeli artists with Jerusalem, but it's also, and of course, the, the Batsal School, which is a place that the museum has been interested in since 1914. But it also actually has to do with modern technology and infrastructure. Because if you've driven along the highways, at least in New Jersey, you will see these uh, retaining walls built out of bales of rocks set in chicken wire. 
That's what this is in gold and pebbles, because that's an Israeli invention for, inv uh, for roadside building, and it was picked up in the American construction industry. So there's that very much modern context about this, nonetheless in a package that makes a traditional jewelry person like me perfectly comfortable. And then the whole concept is semi-precious. Colored stones, semi-precious stones. What does that mean? Semi-precious is a concept that really appears in the 19th and 20th century. It's kind of a market-driven term. It has to do with relative rarity, but it also has, to, and, and it has to do with perception of value. But I promise you that 2,000 years ago, when both lapis lazuli and amethyst were being used, it was a precious material, no matter how easy it was. Now, amethyst is simply a kind of quartz, purple quartz. Unflawed purple quartz is called amethyst. And lapis lazuli is a, is a deep blue stone, which means blue stone. Um, uh, that uh, is mined in Asia and in other places and has been important since Egyptian antiquity. Uh, and both of these materials have survived as popular semi-precious stones because they have these psychological cultural links to when they were precious. So on the left you have a, a quite a large 17th century Spanish pectoral cross with table cut amethysts that are foiled in the back to make them sparkly and it would have been worn by a lay person and you, you look at enough 17th and 16th century portraits and you see crosses like this all the time. Uh, on the back is elaborately worked in a high carat gold uh, and this is the kind of thing was simply worn as a symbol of devotion. But it's more than that because amethyst is associated, purple is associated with royalty. It was the favorite stone of Edward VII, which means nothing in particular. It's just that he liked it. So there was a huge boom in interest in amethysts at the end of the 19th century. Uh, and, but it also had magic powers. And I say magic in the sense that it had powers that were amuletic or curative or protective. Uh, it could cure drunkenness, which is not why I think it was in a cross. But it also <laughs> has links with the holy, with the sacred, and therefore was something that has worn bishops in uh, English, Arch English Anglican bishops wear amethyst rings. It's associated with the church as well as with secular meanings. So uh, all of these things go into the meaning of what makes amethyst precious. Now on the right hand side, these two bracelets made uh, by Cartier in Paris in 1940 for an American heiress and yachtswoman named Hope Goddard Islin. And I must admit, the dealer who pitched these at me, he, he knew he had me at Island because Island, New Jersey was named for her father-in-law. And this is a woman who lived, she was the first woman to sail an America's Cup yacht by her, uh, as the captain. And uh, she lived to be 102 and bought these bracelets in her 70s. So, and, and she would have worn them on one wrist, by the way. And they were worn as a pair. So the two great semi-precious stones along with rock crystal. Uh, and this is, but that's it. There's no meaning. She's not wearing these think, oh, this is going to ward off drunkenness or you know, <laughs> evil or make me sacred. Uh, these were stylish. This was Cartier. This was post, uh, post starting or around the starting of World War I. And so there is cultural meaning to these that was not understood by the uh, owner necessarily, but was very understood by the maker, which is with the outbreak of World War II. I said World War I, I meant World War II, uh, in 1939, uh, the availability of precious gemstones plummeted and American jewelers had to stop using platinum and had to stop using diamonds, rubies, and emeralds, which were coming from places that were troubled. And so they turned to semi-precious stones and balance out the preciousness, the perceived preciousness, by going big and chunky. So scale goes up, semi-precious materials become hugely popular. Things like citrines, which are yellow quartz also. Uh, and so all of that goes into these. So they have cultural meaning, but that was not something that was obvious to the woman who wore them. Uh, likewise, this box on the left, which just looks like a box, it's a vanity case, it's a makeup case, face powder and lipstick, uh, was ordered by Doris Duke from Fulco de Verdura at his New York salon in 1941. Uh, she had bought a box from him with some olivines on the cover, and she apparently thought that was a little drab. Uh, this thing weighs, it's about, Four, and a, four inches wide and three inches deep and an inch high. It weighs about five pounds. Uh, I, I suppose that's an exaggeration. It's a weapon. Uh, <laughs> but she apparently took it back with a bag of stones and said, I don't like this. Do something with these. And so basically, it's an abstract painting done in, done in semi-precious gemstones, citrines, olivines, peridots, garnets. Uh, there, are other, there are various kinds of garnets. But it's a whole kind of muted rainbow of color uh, on all six sides of this little box because 
if you're Doris Duke, you don't carry cash any more than the Queen of England does. You just need makeup. And so, and you also, wherever you go, you can just leave this on the table because you don't hang out in places where they're going to steal it. Uh, <laughs> But this, I did the Doris Duke jewelry show, and I went to the auction at Sotheby's and bought this for the museum. But on the right is a very different take on that same idea of using semi-precious stones uh, to make a comment. This is a sort of the dean of German modern jewelers, Georg Dobler, uh, who has, since the early 21st century, been working with live casts of enormous bugs. These, I believe, are... Um, these are stag beetles. He also likes rhinoceros beetles. And these are life size, though this is about five inches across, and an enormous umbrella cut citrine in this kind of constructivist cage. And what he's riffing on is a piece of Lalique jewelry that he saw that he thought was fantastic and stripped away the Art Nouveau excess as he saw it and put it down to a good bare bones German cons constructivist bugs and a cage with a stone. <laughs> and. Uh, I was totally captivated by this because it's a really ostentatious piece in which the inherent value is not great. It's silver, which is not, which is higher than it used to be, but it's really all about the, it's, it's about a sort of tongue-in-cheek riff on a Gilded Age moment of excess that creates a sort of postmodern moment of excess. And you don't buy something like this unless you get that. This is not something uh, that your average Fifth Avenue shopper. As I better watch what I say, since we're on Fifth <laughs> Avenue. Uh, and even though Doris Duke had this sort of personal connection to gemstones and loved color and loved to fiddle with her jewelry, breaking up that collection was a real tragedy, I think, because it's a very, it was a very interesting collection. Uh, but studio jewelry, art jewelry, has, tends to have a more pointed comment, uh, even if there's not some deep uh, hidden meaning about the state of the world, although maybe there is. Now, I don't, have a, I don't get to indulge in sapphires and emeralds a lot, but I thought I'd show you two things that have uh, connections to the city of Newark, and these uh, are both on exhibit right now, as a matter of fact. On the left, you have a vanity case, sort of like Doris Duke's thing, but you could carry this on your wrist. This is a little purse for a lady who doesn't need cash because she has a chauffeur. Uh, and it's, it has a makeup case, it has a rouge case, and it has a little ivory notebook. Uh, and, a, and a gold pencil for writing down little notes about things like fire the maid. And, <laughs> and her address and phone number are all engraved on the inside frame because, again, wherever uh, Mary Welsh Wanamaker Graham Thompson hung out, it wasn't likely to get lifted. And she was, in fact, the widow of a Wanamaker who remarried to a man named Archibald Thompson and, and lived on the main line. And I, bought this someplace fancy in Philadelphia without a clue that it was made in the city of Newark, which would have most likely put her off. Uh, but it didn't but it didn't take a lot. Here you see sapphires that are interesting cuts, but it's just a little bit. This isn't a vast treasure house of sapphires. It just you sprinkle it's like sprinkling sugar on something. A little powdered sugar just makes it special. So all this is I mean it's gold, but the idea that the sapphires give it a presence, give it a status, give it an ostentation that the lack of sapphires would have lacked. And it just pushed it over the top as this little sprinkling of diamonds that are in there. So it doesn't take a lot. The idea of gemstones adding prestige and, and social power, there's no religious meaning, there's no other meaning to this other than the cultural power of prestige and, and ostentation, because any woman who carried this carried this as a badge of office in a sort of indirect way, even if she was so oblivious to it, like Lady Mary uh, Crawley, who I'm sure you all know. Um, <laughs> She was aware of it even unconsciously. And on the right-hand side is a, is a bag purchased at Cartier in Paris by a, a lady in Newark, with, a formidable lady in Newark named Julia Shanley. Uh, and she would have carried this as an evening bag. And on one side of it is a very elaborate fretwork panel uh, that's all done with Irish roses and shamrocks, because the Shanleys were a very powerful pride, uh, uh, very proud, powerful, proud Irish Catholic family in Newark. Um, and had been since the early 19th century. And then the back is all studded with these big cabochon emeralds. So it's not just about emeralds. There's a little ethnic pride in this, which is not something you tend to see in jewelry purchased at Cartier in Paris. Uh, and then rubies and diamonds. And I'm, I'm, I'm not spending too much time on the precious stones just because I can't really. You know, I have held a $12 million ruby in my hands, and that's not really where I go. As somebody said, uh, that's not jewelry, that's geology, and that's 
a good excuse not to buy them. But I'm really interested in the way stones are used coloristically. And they represent different periods. They represent different meanings. But by the time you get into the sort of the late 1920s and into the 1930s, uh, all of the meaning uh, that is associated with gemstones has evaporated from the surface, but it lingers in the subconscious, let's say. Because if on the right in the late 1920s, this lady went into J.E. Caldwell in Philadelphia and bought this 40 carat encrusted diamond bracelet, uh, so emblematic of the moment when the market crashed. And ironically, the market for diamond bracelets went up during the Depression because the people who didn't lose all their money got more money. And so uh, there are lots of diamond based bracelets being produced all through the 1930s in spite of the Depression. And they were always worn on one wrist, usually more than one at a time. This from J.E. Caldwell I purchased particularly, which you can't see from here, I don't expect you to, but all the way down the center all the stones are various geometric cuts, very much embodying the sort of modernist trends of the late uh, 1920s and into the 1930s. And the closest thing I could come up with, this is really like a marquee at a theater covered with light bulbs that are arranged in shapes. It's not like Art Deco in other ways, but this love of geometric stones crops up in 1928, 1929, according to Vogue magazine, and then takes off. But I purposely bought this because of the shaped stones. Uh, but it represents nothing more than ostentation. It's platinum and diamonds. And I had a little bit of a struggle pushing this past our board of trustees uh, because they said, what about it? And I had to do this whole art history pitch about the geometric stones and Art Deco and modernism, and they finally let me buy it. Uh, <coughs> Uh, and then on the left, this was an easier one. It was also a lot cheaper. Uh, but my friend Janet Zapata found this, by the way. She's been mentioned once. And uh, I sort of nagged her to sell it to the museum. Because this is sort of modern design that's all about showing off and ostentation, but it's also about trends in design, about the shift from the geometry of the Art Deco into the sort of sweeping curves of the modern. But there's also a technological stuff in here. This is known as a Forstner chain. The gas pipe bracelets, the gas pipe necklaces, uh, was something that was developed in the 1930s. And they, they could not be made in platinum. The most you could do was make them in 18 karat white gold. And so this is one of those odd combinations of a platinum top set with rubies and diamonds and a white, car a white gold bracelet. And then this, believe it or not, this is a watch. And you hinge back this sort of paisley shape with these great, these rubies are sort of a pink, a deep pink ruby, which is something very characteristic of the 30s and 40s. And there's this crummy little watch inside <laughs> that looks bat worse than the worst Timex. But it was made by a company in Chicago, uh, Paul Lackritz and Company. And I'm always interested in jewelry that's made in other places than New York City. And now let's go to the basics, though. We've gone through all the gemstones. Now, base metals have a long history. Bronze, iron, there's all sorts of stuff that goes back to prehistory that I don't have. Uh, well, we probably do have bronze things in the collection. I hadn't thought about that. But, uh, but the meaning in metals can be based on what it is. It's not just ornamental. It has some sort of a contextual meaning. And on the left, you have a pair of Berlin work, uh, Berlin cast iron bracelets uh, that we attribute to Johann Conrad Geis. Conrad Johann Geis? Well, anyway, Mr. Geis uh, from Berlin uh, from the 1830s. And I, I, I bought them because they're an intact pair worn on each sleeve like cuffs in the mid 19th century. These are probably 1830s. Plus, they're a mixture of Gothic, Rococo, and Neoclassical, which is about as eclectic as you get at the time. And they're extraordinary. Cast iron jewelry is feather light. It's fragile. It's delicate. It's sort of magical, which is why in the 1830s, when the context is gone, people still like it. It becomes purely showing off. And it's popular, certainly in Germany, but in France and even in the United States. And, uh, and the reason this, this has a historical context that makes it powerful for Germans is during the Napoleonic Wars in the early 19th century, Germans were uh, uh, exhorted to give up their gold and buy iron jewelry as a symbol of supporting the government against the inroads of the evil Napoleon. But by the 1830s, that was sort of a historical memory, and it had simply become a thing. And it was a thing associated with Berlin. And there was a lot of iron stuff produced in Berlin. Now, on the other hand, you have Angela Cummings working for Tiffany and Company in the 1970s. And we're looking at pop graphics. We're looking at all of that kind of hipster stuff and mini dresses and whatever we were wearing in the 1970s, bell bottoms. Uh, and she produces a series of these great cuff bracelets for Tiffany and Company in the late 70s that are lacquered iron inlaid with silver and gold. 
And I might say they were also kind of a marketing flop at Tiffany's because Tiffany and Company has trouble marketing edgy stuff to its clientele. And I won't say anything more about that. And, and they eventually parted ways with Angela Cummings. But, uh, but Angela Cummings knew more than that. She is very distinctly looking at uh, uh, AT, Meiji and Edo period Japanese metalwork uh, and textile design. This is very modernist looking, but it also dates back to what we would call the aesthetic movement when we're ripping off Japan for the first time in our design here uh, <laughs> history. And so there's a complicated history of these sort of circular forms floating asymmetrically around on a dark ground. And we have a lot of Japanese metalwork in our collection in the Asian department. And so I couldn't resist. I have another one that looks like a Vassarelli print that's all sort of swirling checkerboards in black and gold. And then aluminum. Now, aluminum is one of those materials that I was desperate. Uh, I wish I'd had a few more years to hunt, but I snapped up this one. This is an aluminum bracelet from the uh, aluminum mounted gold bracelet from the middle of the 19th century, most likely French. And it's a little hard to see, but the jewels on this bracelet are faceted plaques of aluminum that have been polished and cut to sparkle as if they're gemstones. And they're riveted in place because they didn't have torches hot enough to uh, solder aluminum in the 19th century. And aluminum was one of these mystery things that had a moment of preciousness because it seemed like it was really rare until they realized it's everywhere. It's just really hard to make it into metal. Uh, and so once uh, aluminum was industrialized, it became an industrial material and disappeared out of the world of jewelry uh, until you get into the hardcore art world of the late 20th and early 21st century. This is a piece of tooled aluminum, tooled out of a single block of solid aluminum by Thomas Gentili, who annoyingly, who I'm very fond of, but he annoyingly refuses to date his pieces, which has historians screaming at him. But I'm assuming he made this more or less the time I bought it. Uh, and it is simply a minimalist sculpture, think if you will, a little teeny Donald Judd that you can wear on your lapel. And it's also got this beautiful fragile surface because it will finger mark. So it's one of those things that we handle very carefully. So aluminum used consciously for its lack of preciousness, but for the beauty of its color and surface. And it's an intellectual thing that, I, again, a lot of people aren't going to get it. So if you don't get it, you don't get it. Whereas the aluminum in this bracelet was sparkly and shiny, and everybody got it for a while. And going in the most extreme way, uh, again, I keep trying to push myself because I like shiny and sparkly and I love gemstones and color. Uh, but here on the left is another Israeli artist named uh, uh, Degenit Stern Shokin, who still who's an important jewelry design teacher and craft teacher uh, in uh, in uh, outside of Tel Aviv. She live in her she lives in Herzliya, and uh, and this is a piece she produced in the early of early 21st century called meuhim, which means crushed in Hebrew. And these are literally soda cans from an American company from Coca-Cola Fanta with Arabic inscriptions on them, crushed by tanks at the, can at the Kandalia, uh, Kandalia checkpoint into Ramallah uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the road off the left, uh, the left bank, that's Paris, uh, the west bank <laughs> going between Tel Aviv uh, and Jerusalem. And she has, she set cubic zirconias in these as the little, remember, I'm remembering that I still cringe at the term, but the thousand points of light. But in fact, this is her sense uh, shared with many Israelis today uh, about the, 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 the pain and the suffering of what's going on with the Palestinians in Ramallah and in the West Bank, but also the, the, the hope of change for the future. So that's not what you hear on the news, but that's the way they feel. And on the right is a whole different technology and a whole different idea, a younger uh, male jeweler named Doug Bucci in Philadelphia who has produced this series of 3D printed jewelry pieces in plastic or in this case, molten steel, uh, which is, are called the Islet bracelets, bracelets, which have to do with the fact that he is diabetic and this has something to do with the biological nature of his diabetes. Uh, and we have, a, and actually if you go to our gallery uh, in the museum, we have a video of him talking about this and what it means to him. And, uh, and so this is uh, about content that isn't obvious except to the person who makes it. Now, silver is always a precious metal. Silver is something that the world has loved for thousands of years, but it isn't always obvious. By the end of the 19th century, silver has almost become a semi-precious material. It's used, silver jewelry in the late 19th century is seen virtually as costume jewelry. Uh, and uh, it, it takes art to jump it back up. And indeed, George Jensen is who I would think 
uh, in, in my vote, is the, is the individual who turns the sort of silver of the arts and crafts movement uh, into art jewelry that commands high prices. And I can say this because the Newark Museum bought the first George Jensen jewelry ever in an American museum. And in 1929, we paid $150 for a silver necklace set with Labradorites. And that's a lot of money for a piece of costume jewelry, essentially, in, in 1929. And, but it also places Jensen in that role of shifting the marketing presentation so that this is art, and therefore, it's worth it. Uh, it gives it status, and we have a beautiful uh, uh, lavalier necklace. But I wanted to show this, because this is one I'm particularly fond of, of the post-war years designed by Henning Coppell in the shift from Art Deco or Modern into the sort of biomorphism of the post-war modernism. And this turned out to be an unsaleable necklace. I, I actually found this in a gallery in Paris online. And it was big and clunky and bold, and it's a fantastic design. So Jensen modified it and made it much smaller and more delicate so that American women would buy it, because Jensen was made for the American market. And on the left is even a bigger surprise, a very recent acquisition from a company that didn't tend to do this. But this sort of machine age modernism of the late 20s and the early 30s is not something we associate with Cartier. But this is a bangle, which I call the gear, uh, that was produced by Cartier in the late 1920s and sold into the the 1930s uh, in oxidized silver, polished silver, and applied gold beads. Uh, very much offline for them, very much not part of their general uh, repertoire of carved emeralds and rubies and sapphires, which ironically I can't afford for the museum. Uh, so I was scouting around for something that we could afford by Cartier that was good. Uh, and this jumped out at me because this is a piece of machine age design. It's a piece of sculpture. Uh, and nonetheless, it was chic enough in 1930 that both Marlena Dietrich and the Duchess of Windsor bought models of this. Uh, and so I felt that that's what I needed to say to sell it to the trustees. <laughs> And silver is endlessly powerful. And you know, in 1900, silver was $20 an ounce. I mean, 20 cents an ounce, excuse me. So silver had really plummeted, and, and gold was still $32 an ounce at the turn of the century. But going back in history, silver is a precious metal with all sorts of powers. In Islamic tradition, silver is curative in itself. It, it, it has amuletic powers. And it, interestingly, in the Middle East and in North Africa, all through the uh, 18th, 19th century. The great silversmiths in Yemen and in Syria and in North Africa are all Jewish, making silver for the Muslim population. But on the left, uh, uh, Catholics, uh, Catholics in Europe love silver filigree, and which they get from Islamic silversmiths or from, from Jewish silversmiths working for Muslims. Uh, and so this is a 17th century reliquary cross that you would have worn on a chain around your neck, and something gruesome would have been encaged inside it. It's hinged. But this wonderful swirling Baroque silver filigree. And then on the right, the modern semi-ironic but deeply intellectualized uh, avatar of that, which is called the Lost Da Carrara Bracelet made by Robert Baines, who is the sort of dean of jewelry making in Australia and is a national living treasure in Australia. And he came and studied at the Metropolitan Museum and the Conservation Department on Byzantine filigree work in, from the Met's collection, mm -hmm. and then produced a whole series of jewels, two of which have these great faux histories. So the de Carraras were an actual family in Padua in the 15th century. Uh, in the 14th century, and this is uh, a piece that purportedly belonged to them. It was stolen by the house artist and taken to Africa, hence the giraffes, <laughs> and Australia, hence the, these are electroformed animals. Uh, and, and the proof of this all, and this is in fact in the style of the 14th century, as you would have seen in this sort of uh, early Renaissance mode. And here is the coat of arms of the de Carrara family, which is a flattened carriage in red and white, uh, the only giveaway being that the red is a bicycle reflector. <laughs> and he's actually currently doing a book about this. He does these books about these faux histories. And I will say studio jewelers who work for a living and sell their jewelry at fairs uh, he pisses them off completely because he's an academic with tenure and he can do anything he wants and he doesn't have to sell it. So, um, but as a curator, I like all of these stories. And here we have filigree, old and new. And gold, even something as basic as gold. It's hard to imagine that gold would be seen as sort of 
intellectual and scholarly uh, in the 19th century. This is a, a necklace in the Japanese style by Tiffany and Company, done in three different colors of gold, uh, pink, yellow, and green, marketed in the 1870s. And you know, people who know Tiffany and Company go, oh, the Japanese style, they were totally into this, they did that. This was a total bust in the marketplace, which is why it's so rare. There are only three of these necklaces known because Tiffany couldn't unload them on the carriage trade in the 1870s because they were famous for diamonds and, and colored stones. Uh, and Tiffany couldn't just, couldn't, I, they've certainly sold them to a few. But you had to be an intellectual lady. You had to be a blue stocking from Boston or a literary lady. Uh, read Hazard of New Fortunes by William Dean Howells, which takes place in New York about the time this house is built. And you'll understand that sort of variation in society. So this is a rare thing because it represents an intellectual approach to the use of gold that's about understanding the aesthetics of Asia, even if it's grossly misunderstood, but we were very happy to misunderstand Asia for centuries. And on the right is a modern avatar of that done in the 1980s by Mary Lee Hu, uh, who is the dean, literally the dean of the jewelry department at uh, uh, Washington University, Washington's University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, and I called her the day she retired and said, I want a piece of your jewelry. And she accommodated me rapidly. Uh, and that, they actually have shut down that department. But she started out in the 1960s taking a jewelry course and a macrame course. And she was cramming to get her homework done and combined two assignments by doing a macrame piece in silver wire. Uh, and therefore started her down a path of, of, a, of an iconic technique that she continues to do to this day. But this piece is also inspired by Middle Eastern, by in fact Islamic tile patterns on mosques in the Middle East. And so, I mean, so gold is inherently deemed precious because it is a noble metal and doesn't tarnish. So we'll just leave that behind because, but other than that, I don't see any real reason that gold needs to be precious. But we all believe it. A lot of people in this room are wearing things that have gold in them. But there were times when the preciousness of gold gave it power. So here we have an extraordinary rosary from the very early 17th century made in Spain. Uh, of, uh, and of course, I'm not being a Catholic, I was slapped around by suggesting someone would wear this around. Uh, maybe Madonna would, but I guess nobody really would have worn it. But uh, the rosary beads with the, with the, the 10 uh, Hail Marys and the decade beads for the Our Fathers, but done in both filigree and in, chis and in tooled gold, uh, showing a crest of the Marianists uh, in Spain in the, in the late 16th, early 17th century. But a kind of, uh, the, the use of coral on this is not an accident. Coral is a very powerful amuletic stone that has uh, roots in antiquity. It's been used in Tibet for centuries because it has to be imported into the Himalayas. But it's used all over the world for its amuletic powers. And indeed, the museum owns pairs of baby bracelets from the 1830s that were worn and show up in folk portraits of babies because these coral bracelets and coral necklaces protected them from illness, or so they thought. Whereas on the right side, when the Bolton Company in Chicago makes this big, bold gold brooch in a sort of stilted American Art Nouveau, these beautiful coral accessories are beautiful. And that's it. This is about showing off. This is about big and bold and beautiful color and a few little sparkly diamonds to draw your eye at a cocktail party under gaslight or maybe electricity. But there is no contextual meaning beyond the fact that it's a badge of office, as I've said before. Now, when you get into sort of byproduct materials, you're dealing with this intellectual thing that if you don't get it, you're not going to get it. So when Lucien Gaillard produced this hair ornament, in the form of a cluster of ombel, which is a kind of Queen Anne's lace. He used the, the hot new plastic of the end of the 19th century, which was the byproduct of the beef industry, horn. And I call it, calling it a byproduct of the beef industry. I love doing that because that makes you cringe. I think of dog food, actually. Uh, but, in, but, but that's what it was. It's a proto-plastic. It's cheap. It's worthless. It's easy to get. So you can mess with it. And you can do beautiful things with it. You can make it translucent. You can dye it. You can carve it. It has all the benefits of plastic today. And then even the pearls, all of these rough, fresh water river pearls are essentially worthless in their time. They're pearls. So they have the connotation of aristocracy and power. But these are cheap little pearls. And you have to be able to understand 
that they're echoing the clustered blossoms at the top of the ombel, which as a jewel in itself is a symbolic thing. It's the, one of the flowers of Alsace, this land at the edge of France that in 1900 was part of Germany, but now is part of France. Uh, and uh, you had to, to spend 100 pounds on a piece of jewelry like this. You had to be committed to the idea of this as art and symbol. And similarly, when you're looking at a young artist named Jennifer Trask, uh, who works in recycled bone, recycled ivory, beaver teeth, snake ribs, she makes the most extraordinary organic uh, jewels out of bits and pieces of leftovers, also using broken pieces off of picture frames. Uh, and this is a necklace called Acanthus, and I warmed right up to it because it echoes that classical to Rococo shift in the middle of the 19th century, but presents it in a postmodern way with these, now the term is upcycled, uh, objects. And this one was, uh, this challenged me, and I made the dealer I bought it from, who's a little petite lady, I said, okay, you put this on. If it, you can pull it off, I'll buy it. And she did, and I did. And it's a spectacular object that holds a room. And if you want to make, you, you can make an entrance with a necklace of diamonds, but if you walk into a room wearing this, everyone will notice you as well, and actually for the same reason. It's a status thing, it's an ostentatious thing, but it's more about the mind than about the bank account. Uh, likely wood. I'm wearing, I'm wearing my Bruce Metcalf piece, which really clashes with my accessories, but I had to wear it. And Bruce is one of these incredible intellectual <laughs> craftsmen. He's a writer, he's a jeweler, he's a craftsman, uh, and he's an artist, and he, he embraces all of those titles. And he spends as much time putting together, he makes all of the elements of these by himself, carves them, paints them, obsesses about them. But if you've ever studied the way Piet Mondrian uh, spent hours adjusting the lines and the colors in all of his paintings. This is what Bruce does for this. And I heard him give a lecture about this in Philadelphia at the Art Alliance about his jewelry making. And that's when I realized that these aren't just random assemblages of stuff thrown together. This may look like weirdo junk just plopped together on a table. But this is a carefully thought out, rational, intellectual exercise in jewelry making. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, jewelry makers who spend their lives trying to make a living making and selling things like this are often angry. Uh, and on the right, <laughs> a, a, a much more kind of traditional way of doing it, a young woman in, in Skrea, Norway, named Liv Blovarp, who is the daughter of a Norwegian, you know, good Nor Scandinavian modern uh, furniture maker using beautiful exotic woods in their natural colors to make these great sort of ceremonial collars that are quite comfortable and wearable. Uh, and those are two things I acquired because I like wood. Ceramic, I'm, gonna, I'm buzzing through the end of this. Uh, on the left is a piece I couldn't resist. It's quite little, but it's a Wedgwood plaque, a Jasperware plaque. Uh, Josiah Wedgwood was a fascinating person. Not only was he the first sort of industrial producer of ceramics on a massive scale, he was one of the brilliant marketers, but he also funded the Beagle, because Charles Darwin was his son-in-law, and he was a, an adamant anti-slavery. Uh, advocate throughout Europe. He sent a group of these, what he called them is emancipation badges to Benjamin Franklin, and Lord knows I'd love to find one of those. But this one went to Stockholm where it was mounted in gold and enamel in the 1780s, and the mark is on it. I've totally forgotten the name of the maker. But the, the, uh, the Swedish were among the leaders of the abolition movement in Europe in the 18th century. So this becomes a powerful use of a material for political purposes. Uh, and there's also a powerful uh, use of material for uh, spiritual purposes, I suppose. And these, in fact, are ancient faience scarabs uh, dug up in Egypt in the, in the middle of the ninth or third quarter of the 19th century. And this is a bracelet that was put together with these ancient scarabs in Paris in 1872 for the marriage of a young woman from Newark to her fiance, who was a young man from Newark. Uh, and and the, the back story there is that the man who gave them to him was her uncle, Edwin Smith, who was a famous, even notorious Egyptologist who encouraged the Egyptians to make and sell fakes to tourists uh, <laughs> because he was angry at the European looting of, uh, of Egyptian historical sites, even though he did it himself for a living. Uh, but then the symbolism, the symbolism of the faience scarab uh, which is a very strange thing to use in the context of a Christian wedding, but indeed the scarab becomes a symbol of endurance, of patience, of longevity, and therefore this bracelet was a guarantee that this marriage would survive, as indeed it did. And glass, the only piece of Lalique we own, uh, 
Lalit got so frustrated by not being able to unload that expensive art jewelry on clientele. As beautiful as it was, people, most people just didn't get it. So he moves into glass, which becomes his salvation and his commercial success. This one little glass pendant from the 1920s does everything that a gemstone does. It transmits light. You can color it. You can mold it. Uh, and yet it doesn't have any of the problems, i.e. price, of, uh, of gem material. So it's essentially a worthless piece that he has transformed into a work of art. And on the right, the modern avatar of that, a, a New York jeweler named Bibba uh, Schutz, uh, who uh, is known for her sort of structurally spiky stuff in, tar in tarnished uh, uh, silver and brass and copper, did a, did a fellowship up at the Corning Glass Museum uh, in the Corning Studios and created this whole group of extraordinary blown and sandblasted and cut and polished jewels that seem vaguely calligraphic but in fact are nothing more than abstract gemstones set into oxidized silver. So it's a transformation of a per worthless material into a work of art uh, and using the, the essential qualities of that material to make it beautiful and alluring. And enamel is nothing more than ground up gold. So in the 18, 1880s, 1980s, you have Earl Pardon, who is an art teacher, a sculpture teacher, a jewelry teacher up at Skidmore, uh, who works as an enamelist who makes jewelry that's all about enamel as a painting medium. He's a colorist. It's all about the use of colors, both gemstones, semi-precious mostly, and colored enamels on gilded silver and silver backing. So this is art jewelry that is, if, that is echoing his interest in art as a painter and, in fact, as a sculptor. And on the right, a different artistic vision. Uh, one of my favorite acquisitions is what the so-called, so-called because I named it that, the Rehan Jewel. And if you go to the Metropolitan Museum and you go to the, the gallery where the sergeants are, there's a portrait of the woman for whom this was made uh, hanging there by sergeant. And the portrait was commissioned by the same woman who commissioned this jewel for Ada Rehan in, in one of the great celebrity crushes of the late 19th century, apparently, uh, a textile industrialist's wife from Massachusetts who gave Ada Rehan jewelry over a period of two decades until Ada Rehan died and left all the jewelry back to Mrs. Whitten, who had commissioned the portrait and then gave it to the Met. So this is an amazing piece of plique jour enameling. And if you look at this, any of you who are craft inclined, each of these blossoms is made out of a single sheet of gold hammered to millimeters th thin. And then every single cell is cut out by hand with a saw. And then the hard part starts, which is the production of all of this incredibly complex uh, shaded enamel. And then on top of that, this, the brooch mechanism can be removed and there's an enameled gold necklace that places the, uh, the jewel right at your throat, right at the base of your throat. And then you go into the symbolism. This is the kind of jewel that only an actress would have worn in America because this has no diamonds. It has no sapphires. It was made by Marcus and Company, uh, and, and we have the original box. And Marcus and Company did some amazing jewelry. And they were the only company in America to do these large-scale plique jour pieces. And I'm sure it's because they had a French enamelist in there who lasted a couple of years, and then the stuff didn't sell, so they fired him and sent him back. But uh, this is also all articulated so that it moves as you move. And then there's a whole symbolist thing. Americans tend to avoid symbolism. Uh, we, we don't do this whole French thing. Uh, and yet this piece is totally a symbolist jewel. It's a symbol of the Holy Trinity. It's a symbol of love, faith, and um, hope. Uh, it's also. Uh, that morning glory is also a symbol of resurrection and a symbol of unrequited love. And there's an, there's an untold story here that I may never parse out, uh, but we've been building the documentation. And it certainly is a masterpiece of the jeweler's art. But it's the kind of piece that was an expensive object in its day entirely because of the craftsmanship and the content, not because of the geology. Robert Ebendorf one of the old masters teaching up at New Paltz, now working in North Carolina, is famous for his flotsam and jetsam, his found objects. There are whole necklaces, great cascading necklaces made out of lobster claws and sea glass. Uh, and he sent me these. I was whining to him in a letter saying, ah, I don't have enough modern jewelry and I want to get more. And so he sent me nine of these randomly in a box, which wasn't exactly what I am meant, but I got them. <laughs> but here it is, random found objects. This is an African trade bead. This is the handle of a nail file or something, some sort of a pebble off the beach. Another kind of an African trade bead, a little chunk of something or other. Uh, random coins, that's a piece of bone. 
So little bits and pieces that he finds and he strings together in ways that he finds sculpturally pleasing. And I love stringing them on these red sort of Kabbalah uh, strings. And that's, that's a whole line of things that he does and he's still doing them today that have this powerful amuletic meaning but only if you give it to them because they're just little assemblages of things as far as he's concerned. And then finally, back to plastic. Uh, uh, plastic is this troublesome material. It's chemical. It's about big industry. It's about polluting the oceans and the landfills and the plastic that fills our lives. But, in, but plastic has this magic quality because you can do anything with it. And this is from the late 60s, made by a New Jersey artist by the name of Carolyn Kriegman, and, and purchased by my first boss's first wife, a woman named uh, Nell Miller in the late 1960s, who would have rocked the world of Newark society, which did exist and still exists, so don't <laughs> give me that look. Um, <laughs> when she wore this on one of her courage dresses to a party in Newark, and there's a ball that swings back and forth inside that sort of psych psychedelic dome there. So this is sort of New Jersey craft version of pop jewelry of the late 60s, which really inspired me to collect uh, plastic. And this is a piece by another New Jersey artist named Elise Winters called Red Ruffle Rouge. And it's all about taking FEMO, this children's modeling plastic polymer clay, and uh, mucking with it, painting it, embedding gold in it, mo modeling it. And the great thing about polymer clay is that you can, you can, you don't have to have a kill like you do with enameling. You can, you can cure it in a toaster oven. <laughs> so it's something that, uh, that really plunged into the, the minds of the hobbyists of the late 1980s and has become this rather extraordinary medium for experimentation. And since we started with plastic, we'll end with plastic. And as you see, there's no value to these except to the people who make it and the people who own it. And the society we live in today helps us. We, as students of art and design, understand what these mean, even if the preciousness in them is all in our heads. Because ultimately, the preciousness in anything is all in our heads. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Um, so we do have time for Q&A. There should be a microphone or there's a pair of microphones going around. Um, so if anyone has comments, I need to, for the live stream, I'm going to make sure that we're... It says here, thank you, Ulysses. So you had to remind yourself to thank you. <laughs> <laughs> giving away the trade secrets. Huh? <laughs> it's genuine. So were there questions? I just beat you into submission. <laughs> okay. Hi, I was just wondering what your background is. Are you like more like have you always just been in the history, or have you done like gem like stuff for like actually with the jewelry? <sighs> no, it's a good question. I, I'm certainly no. I'm not a gemologist. Uh, although I love gemstones and I've learned whatever you can learn just listening to people. Uh, the jewelry world is a strange world because it's a very commercial world. It's not museum oriented at all. 47th Street is not a museum friendly place, although I do shop there. Uh, I, I really approached jewelry as a curator of decorative arts, as having studied objects and their design and production and the meaning in their cultural context. Uh, the only advanced degree I have is in American material culture. Uh, which is sort of an anthropological spin on art history. And uh, so I approached jewelry initially from the point of view of design and craftsmanship. And the, the material aspect of it has just been sort of a, an undercurrent because materials and everything fascinates me. The difference between porcelain and pottery and all the prestige associated with that. And there will be a lecture about that tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. So did that answer your question? Yeah. So I'm very much an amateur. I may pretend to be a professional, but. Uh, you said you were parsing out a story about the morning glory brooch. You well, it's just a fascinating story because there is not a lot of history. There is a lot of history of men giving actresses jewelry, Sarah Bernhardt being one of them. Uh, there's not a lot of history of women giving actresses jewelry. And so Mrs. Whitten had a thing for Ada Rehan, who made her debut in 1885 in Newark uh, as a teenager. And, and I'm just, there, there is a story there. And that brooch is such a massive token of 
love and faith that, uh, and, but the family, the, by the time the family sold it at auction two years ago in New York City, they were wearing it, they'd been wearing it on Halloween costumes because they thought it was a costume piece. So <laughs> I proved them wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, what are your thoughts on uh, colored diamonds, and do you think they're any more or less important than clear ones? I love that question. I, you see, now I'm not, if I was a diamond merchant, I would tell you something different. I love colored diamonds, and sort of, they, they have, it, with the exception of the really rare ones, like the Hope Diamond, uh, or really important yellow diamonds, or something like that, colored diamonds have always been considered lesser, uh, except for the important oddball ones. Uh, I happen to love colored diamonds. I know Louis Tiffany himself used a lot of off-color diamonds, brown and orange, and things that were considered sort of unmarketable because he used them very coloristically. It's the only time he uses diamonds is when they're sort of oddball colors. Uh, so, I, I mean, diamonds can be very powerful and very beautiful, but I'm, I'm not about big rocks. So, although in a week or so I'm going to go try on Shirley Temple's nine carat blue diamond <laughs> with a group of trustees of the museum because we're getting a little thing at Sotheby's in their uh, jewelry department. So I'm dazzled by great stones, but I got to say the Hope Diamond doesn't excite me any more uh, than anything else. And yet it is visited by four out of the five million visitors to that museum every year. It's the most seen jewel in the history of humankind. <laughs> And if I owned the Hope Diamond, I would sell it instantly. <laughs> because think of the endowment I could create with that. Barry? Paper. Paper, I, I do have some paper jewelry. I actually just bought a piece by an American artist named Lauren Tickle, Lauren Vanessa Tickle, which is extraordinary. It's this great Baroque necklace that's green and it's made out of the curly cues cut out of dollar bills. It's called the $145 necklace because she cut up $145 bills and then s laminated them and stacked them into oxidized silver mounts. It's absolutely breathtaking. I just bought that. And uh, although paper worries me because of conservation issues. So uh, I have some paper mache pieces by Marjorie Schick. Uh, who works in large scale, and so far that's it. We do have some rolled paper necklaces made out of magazine covers during the Depression. That's what inspired me there. So I'll get to paper. Uh, thank you for your talk. I just wanted to ask, and this actually follows from the comment you just made about uh, conservation practices, and I'm curious as how that maybe complicates your collecting practices, because I feel like it's very in-depth collecting. And, and, and I'll tell you because uh, it's, a good, it's a good question because, it, and I think because, how do I say this without embarrassing myself? The Newark Museum has this vast collection and we do not have a staff curator, a conservator. Uh, thank God we're next to New York so we have access to any conservator who can do anything. But we're probably the only museum our size in the country without a conservator on staff. We have contract conservators. So I'm very concerned about anything that we can't play constant vigilance on relative, because I'm, a, I'm careless in my own way. So I, I did, in fact, buy, just buy a piece by Kif Slemons, who's somebody who's worked a lot with paper. She's a great, important figure in the studio jewelry movement. But I, ought, buy, I bought a piece made out of pearl buttons, because I figured nothing's going to happen to them. <laughs> so I do think about that. And, and all across, when we think about this constantly, all across the departments, is uh, conservation issues and displayability. We do not have a large exhibition staff. Uh, therefore, we can't rotate collections constantly uh, the way you're supposed to with works on paper. So I'm very mindful of conservation elements. There are gemstones that fade if you leave them out. And I've just been told by another jewelry curator that the pearls can't be left out in the bright light. So that totally ticks me off. I didn't know that. <laughs> That was not something that came across our radar, so that beautiful string of pearls I can't just leave out forever until they decompose into dust. So they'll have to go away. But so I am mindful of that. Thank you.